welcome back to this Dialogue Web Extra. I'm Marcia Franklin. We're continuing our conversation about the 60th anniversary of the Korean War. With me are four veterans of the war from Idaho. I'm pleased to have them here and to continue our discussion. I would like to hear from all of you what, what a main memory is for you of, of the war. Harold? I don't know. I was just a young kid over there. and. I don't know, the, uh, we're, we're taught to uh, follow orders, you know, even at home. Did you uh, see things that uh, you remembered once you came home? And anybody here see things that they couldn't get out of their mind? Mm -hmm. Chuck, you're nodding your head. Yes, I've, uh, we lovingly call it the funny farm. We go out to the uh, VA hospital and all the veterans sit around and, and we discuss things that bother us and, and uh, it took me quite a while to, so I didn't have dreams at night. And when, when you came home there's no such thing as uh, the diagnosis of PTSD which we have now, post-traumatic yeah. stress dis disorder. Never heard of it. No, heard of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, Art Motes, you're joining us. Uh, yes. You were a Navy Corpsman. You saw so much in that job. Navy, Navy Corpsman helped save people's lives. You were assigned to the U.S. Marine Corps. Um, yes. When you think back on this experience, was it difficult for you when you came home to get things out of your mind? <clears throat> it was extremely difficult because uh, uh, there were several times that uh, uh, my late wife <clears throat> had to endure me uh, jumping up out of bed and uh, reliving something uh, right off the moment and uh, uh, did that for oh about three or four months and then the uh, VA uh, gave me a, a pill that was supposed to help and uh, it seemed to uh, it uh, cut down on all the times that uh, I would have this there were two or three dreams that I had special all the time mm -hmm. so <clears throat> the first one was uh, the time that uh, uh, I thought the this fellow that I didn't care for too much that was behind me that uh, threw a rock and hit me in the back. And uh, that was when I'd uh, been hit by a burp gun slug. And uh, I relived that even, t even uh, lately I've even thought about that since there's been so much uh, saber rattling going on over there between South and North Korea already. Mm -hmm. What was the reception when you got home? <coughs> when you came home, did people have an understanding of what you'd been through? Probably not. It's hard to explain to anyone, but were people apathetic? Were people con congratulatory? Well, we I came home in a troop ship that had the first uh, Marine veterans come back from Korea. And we landed in San Francisco, and they had a parade of buses, and they put us all on those buses and drove, them, drove us around through the city over to T Treasure Island. And there were about, oh, I guess about 3,000 of us on that boat. And they had us all out of there in less than a week on our way home. And uh, we, we got a good uh, welcome back home from the people in San Francisco and in the nation, I guess it started going across the nation because it started to happen. What but about the rest of you? What was your reception like? Uh, Mr. Mocha shaking your head. <clears throat> not the same type? Uh, of no, not the same. Uh, I, I even walked, walked the streets and uh, people that I knew would uh, just uh, say, hi, how are you doing? And uh, there was nothing about uh, the Korean War or uh, oh, Art, I read about you in the paper th that uh, you were wounded, or Art, I read about you that uh, uh, you had done this or that, uh, but uh, there was nothing that was really uh, emotional about it. It was just personable. Devoid of emotion, whereas inside of you, you were having a lot of emotion right. going yes. on. Yeah. You, Chuck, same for you when you came home? Well, <clears throat> nobody seemed to care. Uh, I had I had uh, a number of people uh, come up to me and say, "How's college?" 
<laughs> well, I haven't seen you in a couple of years. I thought you were at college, mm -hmm. telling me you were in Korea, and it, that's just like throwing water on yeah. the conversation. The conversation. They, oh, uh, mm -hmm. so no, no one really cared. No one cared. People mm -hmm. were just moving on. <laughs> well, in defense of that, I think you got to consider that uh, World War II was only five years. Mm -hmm. uh, True. And uh, True. they had their war too. In the greatest generation, well, we were started part of that greatest generation ourselves. We just happened to be the young brothers and sons that came along later and went to Korea. And the attitude, I know I had a dream like uh, you did. I kept dreaming the same dream. And I come around the corner of a house and there's a machine gun there with a North Korean in it. And just about the time he pulls the trigger, I wake up. He's never shot me yet. But I haven't, I haven't had that dream in years. But it, it is repetitious. Mm -hmm. I came home and my mother came in to <clears throat> wake me up in the morning to ask me what I wanted for breakfast, and I blacked both of her eyes. Oh, because she you bent over to kiss me, and I just come out of it. And you I, were surprised. You were surprised. I guess. Uh, I, I never was so sorry for anything <laughs> in all my life. But one, one time I was walking down the down the street. <clears throat> with my late wife in, in my hometown and a car backfired and I rolled under a car. Mm. I just dove under it and uh, I never felt so silly in my life but it just, I wasn't even thinking anything about it but as soon mm. as that uh, backfired like that I was down and under the car. So this obviously leads to the closeness then between the bond in talking with other people in the military. You're probably closer to some of your military brothers than maybe in some instances your own family. Is that, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a bond because oh, only yeah. you can talk very about much it. So, yeah. Very much so, very much so. Art, I want to talk a little bit more about your job <laughs> because uh, you weren't on the main program. Uh, but we really want to explain a little bit more. Navy, Navy corpsmen, and, and I watched a bunch of documentaries preparing for this, but people would call out, you know, when they were wounded, they would call for the corpsmen. Mm -hmm. And you, you were the individual that came over and tried to save lives. Yes. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about that experience and some of the people you were able to save, and unfortunately, I'm sure there were many others you weren't able to. Well, there were some that uh, mostly during during the winter, uh, frostbite season. Uh, I used to have to do uh, toe or finger amputation when it was gangrene when it. He mentioned turning black, <clears throat> and uh, that was even at the time that they couldn't get helicopters into us where we could get some of the wounded out to the Constellation, which was a hospital ship. Uh, I had one uh, uh, Marine that kept wanting to get, uh, get the Congressional Medal of Honor, it seemed like. He would do anything just to uh, get even a Purple Heart. and. Uh, Nothing would ever happen to him. He came in to me one day smiling and he, he opened his lips and there was a hole between his teeth and there was a piece of shrapnel that was burnt on the back of his tongue. And uh, I, I cut that off and... Uh, <laughs> cut he, his purple heart. Yes, cut the shrapnel off. But uh, landmines were also a danger? Oh yes, the bouncing beddies were, were about the worst. I uh, had a lieutenant that uh, tripped a bouncing betty and it <clears throat> blew off part of his skull. And uh, I had some uh, uh, some pretty good wet gauze there, and we did get a helicopter in in time. And I flew back to the hospital ship, holding holding it uh, uh, holding it on his head. And I learned two days afterwards that he had passed away. But uh, this was trench warfare. I mean, this was back mostly to, trench this was warfare. Mostly trench. I mean, it was it was it was back <coughs> to a type of fighting that we saw in yeah. World War One. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, there's uh, <coughs> combat, aggressive combat, and it lasted from August uh, or June till uh, the end of December, and then it went into the static because now the Chinese have the upper half of the country, and they're bringing in more and more people, and then they started digging bunk <coughs> bunkers. And <clears throat> I'm glad I was out of there because I don't think I could have lived in a bunker. <clears throat> well, and, and at night, uh, all they did was march back and forth, blowing, blowing bugles, 
and uh, the Chinese. Yes, the Chinese, and and having dogs bark, you know, trying to harass you, and uh, you, it got to where you could even sleep during during most of that. Uh, but they, at night, they just kept it up all the time, thinking that they could uh, demoralize the uh, the Americans. But uh, I don't think it it worked at all. Well, the whistles and the screaming is <coughs> what bugged me more than the bugles. Mm -hmm. They'd blow those stupid whistles and yeah. and they'd scream and they'd make <coughs> you think, well, here we come, mm -hmm. and you had to be alert in case they did come, but 90% of the time they didn't. Well, you're, uh, as mentioned in the program, you're American-born Chinese. Mm -hmm. um, was it was it strange for you to be hearing, uh, you know, I mean, the Chinese were the enemy. Uh, did you fear at all that somebody might mistake you, or uh, did you feel uh, uh, uncomfortable about, you know? Oh, about that time there, they all know where I, uh, I was restricted to this, to the, within the uh, command post. Uh, in fact, as an order. Was given because they to were me. worried about friendly fire. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, oh, by the time Chinese come in there, the uh, you know they always start kidding me down there. Is that they uh, you better fix the radio uh, so we can take care of your cousin over there. And, uh, <laughs> you know, they're all joking with me about it. And, did you have a sense, though? I mean, really, to be serious about it, some of your your family, I'm sure, is still in China. I mean, yeah. what is it like then, having them the, be the enemy, be of the same descent as you are? Uh, or you just feel I'm an American, and well, you know, the uh, uh, they're still the enemy. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, they're going to kill me just as easy as they're going to kill them type of situation, and. Um, I don't know. It, it didn't. It didn't affect me. That yes, one of my nationals over there is the other guy shooting at me. Uh, only thing I know is that the enemy was shooting at me. Not Art. I want to talk a little bit, and then I want uh, with you about something else. And I want to go to uh, someone we have on the phone, Pat Murphy. Uh, you had an an interesting situation where because you were out and about more, you were able to meet with. Uh, average Koreans. Yes. Um, and we have some photographs that you, you took as well. Yes. And, and uh, you enjoyed your visits. Well, <clears throat> the reason for that was I wanted to uh, to show the uh, Koreans that uh, that were round and about us that uh, it wasn't that the Americans were such an aggressor, but that we were there helping them. And uh, I tried uh, tried my very best to uh, put on that kind of a uh, put on that kind of a face when I met them, and when I would uh, be greeted by them, and uh, when the ambulance driver and I would go through some of their uh, uh, some of their small villages and stop, uh, we tried to do very very uh, little except to smile a lot. And to show them that uh, uh, we were there to help them and not to hurt them. We just saw a picture of I think it was like a uh, Mary or the Madonna. Uh, many Koreans are Presbyterian, which yes. you told me mm -hmm. surprised you when you yes, got over I, there. Yes, I was surprised about that. I thought that they would be uh, Buddhists or uh, Shinto or something like that. But uh, the majority of the Koreans that uh, that I met and uh, that I was able to, uh, with Chaplain Elliot, uh, talk, talk about. Uh, they were Presbyterians. Uh -huh. Pat Murphy, uh, on the phone with us from Ketchum, Idaho, you were a war correspondent for the Army, and you too had the op opportunity to see the, uh, many more locations than the average soldier. Did you have interaction with uh, Koreans as well? Not much. Uh, we took off from the Pusan perimeter and. Uh, mid uh, to late September of 1950 on uh, Task Force 777, and we just scooted up the peninsula as fast as we could. And uh, we didn't really stop at all. In fact, we uh, outran our supply lines. Uh, the Koreans I saw were basically refugees or casualties. They were uh, always just streaming south. Um, you know, we. We would have some encounters with the Papasans and the Mamasans, 
but uh, not much. It was uh, pretty much we were on the on the run. You were with a very unique. Uh, you were in a very unique situation uh, as a war correspondent. When you look back, but you were also obviously trained to to fight. Um, when you look back on your experience, what what are some of the things that stand out for you? Well, I think I'll agree with the the Marines there. The cold was just awful. Uh, and the uh, frostbite casualties and the shrapnel ca casualties were just horrible. Uh, in our sector, the biggest problem we had with the Chinese were uh, they had these 120 millimeter mortars and they were deadly with them. Uh, the, the story we heard, of course, is that they could put a mortar round down a chimney, uh, but they were deadly because they had these. Uh, uh, proximity fuses that would set off the, the round above the ground and just uh, spew these uh, pieces of shrapnel in all directions for oh, hundreds of yards. And some of you, one of you at least still has some shrapnel to prove it, right? Yeah. Well, they, uh, they took uh, <clears throat> most of it out, but uh, <clears throat> the doctor said that uh, they do more damage digging the smaller ones out than, than and that, that yeah. I've had a couple of them come to the surface and and I've had them removed, but uh, most of them are still in there, but they're little teeny pieces. Just set off the detectors, right? Yeah, they set the detector off <laughs> and, uh, oh, and you go flying. <laughs> now, Pat Murphy, you got almost to the Yalu River. Um, what's your sense of, uh, you touched on it a little bit in the, in the program, but your sense of whether MacArthur should have been allowed to keep going up? Well, I never did understand that. Of course, as one of the one of your guests said that we, what we knew about the war was, uh, was just what it was going on around us for five feet or so. Uh, we never did understand that strategy of just going and going and going, and then getting kicked as bad as we did and having to retreat. Uh, we learned later, of course, that MacArthur was just uh, determined he was going to get to the Yalu, and even, uh, and the reason he got fired for insubordination is he kept talking about bombing China. So I, I never did understand that strategy. It just didn't make any sense. And of course, we ended up uh, south of the 38th parallel after that retreat. Do you agree, Rick, or do you think you should have been able to go all the way up? Well, I've, uh, I'm from a di different perspective. Uh, <clears throat> yes, we should have gone to the Yalu all the way up. We were only 40 miles away from it when the Chinese hit the uh, Eighth Army, and they changed our, our direction from going north to going east or west to uh, offset the uh, pressure that was on those people over there on that side. But uh, MacArthur, uh, well, he knew he was a genius, and uh, in a lot of ways he was. But the uh, it, it, it's just a matter of history now. So what, what are you going to talk about? <laughs> What's done is done. Do you have any sense on that art? Or? <laughs> well, that's about <clears throat> when uh, uh, when General MacArthur uh, was there. It, it seemed that uh, the the morale was extremely high, and uh, af after the uh, the problems that he had with the with the president, and uh, when he left and Ridgeway took over, it seemed that. Uh, uh, the morale wasn't really as high as it w had been. Uh, and I think it was just because of uh, MacArthur's prestige and uh, uh, the ge great general that he had been. So, uh, but after a while, uh, all, all that was, was forgotten. And uh, it's like he said, he just faded away. Well, MacArthur was very aloof. And he had <clears throat> everything in control. He was, uh, uh, he, what he said went. When Ridgeway got there, he came out and he had those two uh, practice grenades. Oh, on no, his, they weren't practice. <laughs> oh, the heck they weren't. <laughs> you could see the corks at the bottom of them. <laughs> but he came out there and I'm just one of you guys and blah, 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 you know. And that turned everybody off, really did. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know. I'm up here, and then by the time the sun sets, I'll be back uh, sipping champagne at one of the air bases. <laughs> Pat, what's your sense? <laughs> I'm just laughing. <laughs> oh, 
Well, I think MacArthur was a great showman, no question about it. You know, the corn cob pipe and that that uh, hat of his with all the scrambled eggs. Um, and uh, he was he was a terrific showman. And, of course, the troops loved to see him when he got up to the front. But uh, here again, I just think it was insane that we went all the way up the yellow because of the losses we incurred. My gosh, thousands of people died. And, of course, how much it cost us in treasure, I'll, we'll never know exactly. Does any um, does anyone see any comparison at all be, be, between what happened just now with uh, President Obama and General McChrystal and this situation between Truman and MacArthur? I there? think we're making exactly the same mistakes we made in Korea over in Afghanistan right now. Meaning? Meaning that uh, the political aspects, uh, we could have won that war and lost a lot fewer men in Korea if, they would, if the pol uh, political people would have just let us. Let us do what? Let us go ahead and, and win it. Mm. Give us what we needed and go up there and... and uh, uh, so you, you right now are feeling demoralized by what you're seeing over in... I, I, think, I think history's repeating itself in this, and I think we'll have the same problem. You have, uh, <laughs> Rick, I believe you have a grandson in both Iraq, or just coming back from Iraq, and one in Afghanistan? Yes, in fact, uh, uh, my old, oldest grandson is a captain in the Army, and so is his wife, and they came back from Iraq. They did their tour of duty. And my other grandson, uh, he's uh, got 15 years in the Army. He's a sergeant first class. And he's on his second tour in Afghanistan. And are you, what's your sense? Are you worried about them? Do you think this, these are failed wars? I failed definitely wards? worry about them because the way this war is being fought, uh, like Vietnam, uh, you don't know who the enemy is. They don't wear uniforms. They don't carry flags. and uh, so. You're in a defense of 360 degrees, uh, 24 hours a day. What's your sense? Either of you want to weigh in on this, on uh, Art or Harold, on the no, the uh, McChrystal situation. No, the uh, war is a war. You know, to uh, <coughs> let the professional do it. You no, know? let the uh, generals do it, and 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 the political thing. You know. Uh, they should stay out of it. You know? But we do have civilian control of our military, so. Well, I the mean, uh, yeah, they should have uh, a overall, but then don't uh, micromanage the uh, battlefield. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Pat, what's your sense? Uh, about what? Well, you said in the in the program that you're you've become as a result of uh, not only your service in Korea but wars that you covered since then, as a correspondent. Uh, pretty much. No, I, I think Afghanistan is a, is a lost cause, not not so much because of the the strategy there, but for hundreds of years that country has never been tamed by anybody. The Brits, or the Russians, uh, Alexander the Great, etc. They all got chased out. And uh, the country is ruled by a bunch of uh, warlords and tribal chieftains. Um, we'll never win there. It's, uh, I think it's a, a fool's mission, quite frankly. Um, and, I, you know, we can disagree on the strategy, but I just don't think history is on our side. Cycling back to the Korean War, let me ask each one of you, what, maybe this is too big a question, but try it. How, how did serving in the Korean War change you as a person? What did it do for you? It uh, had very much to do with me becoming a career Marine. I was had two years in the Marine Corps and I was 18 months on Guam and nothing but uh, infantry tactics. And the general that uh, had us there on Guam in 1948 was also the same general that took the 1st Marine Brigade to uh, Busan and we fought in the Pusan perimeter. But the being there uh, afterwards, it, it's easy like now to talk about it. And the position that you had, most of it was personal. We, we always looked out for our buddy. In, in combat, you look out for your buddy. It isn't the flag, it isn't mom and apple pie, it's your buddy because he's the guy that's gonna be at your back and he's gonna be when you're sleeping, he's gonna be on watch. So 
So he's more concerned with it. And those kind of relationships are, uh, well, friendships and uh, brotherhood that were born in the, in the foxhole. I still talk to people that I spent the night with many times. But the effect, <coughs> I was married three weeks after I got home from Korea. And I went down to San Diego and became a drill instructor. And that infected still also. And uh, that's when I started re-enlisting. And I knew I was going to be a Marine when my, my brother landed on Iwo Jima. So I, I did make a 26-year career out of it. Before we move on, I want you to read this sentence. This is something that you wrote about the place that you served, the Chosen Reservoir. <clears throat> well, I'm talking about the little town of uh, Agaru. It was a nowhere place that became the center of the universe for weary men who were only looking for tomorrow, yet dreading the long night it took to get there. That was the battle that, 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 that that's sentence, as far as I can go. Yeah, that sentence is, I think... Uh, Where'd you find it, that? Oh, <laughs> stuck in a book someplace. It was a nowhere place that became the center of the universe for weary men who were only looking for tomorrow, yet dreading the long night it took to get there. Yeah. Very well put. When you think back on the Korean War, what did it, how did it affect you as a person? <clears throat> well, I went over there... Uh, a happy-go-lucky, beer-drinking, woman-chasing kid. And I came home a, <laughs> a much different person. I, I still drank the beer, but I wasn't happy-go-lucky by any means. So it, 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 <clears throat> it, it had a very, well, they took a happy-go-lucky kid and made a killer out of him. Mm -hmm. And that's... Yes. That's what the training was. and It doesn't take very long for a boy to become a man when he's being shot at. Your sense, uh, Art and Harold? <clears throat> well, I, um, I personally, when I came back, how it changed me was the flag meant a lot more to me than it did before I went. The Star Spangled Banner meant a lot more to me than when I had gone over, before I had gone over, when I came back. It's something that uh, I have a picture at home of an elderly man standing with his hand over his heart as the flag is passing in front of him on a parade with people sitting on the curb just talking to each other. And uh, patriotism, to me, means a lot more now than before I went over. And I'd, I'd, I'll go back to Korea and help them again if, uh, if they need me. But uh, I, I think as a person, I'm much more patriotic and uh, God and country and family mean so much more than it used to. And around your neck is a, a medal that you just received. Yes, the, uh, <clears throat> I have a medal here that was given to uh, 18 of us in uh, uh, Las Vegas, which uh, was given to us by the Republic of Korea president uh, as uh, commemorating 60 years of the Korean War. And uh, that uh, uh, the lady that, that presented it to me, and when I spoke to her later, she said that uh, most of it came because you left blood in our dirt. And so uh, this medal means uh, quite a bit to me now. As it should. Mm -hmm. And Harold, what did the serving in the war do for you as a person? Oh, one of the things, he really made a believer out of me. You know, with the, uh, you know, I didn't believe in God or anything like that there. And then the, uh, when I was over there and the situation that happened, not only once, but a couple times, and uh, I made a believer of me and said, that, you know, someone's watching over me. And uh, 
or someone's keeping book, you know, it's not my time, you know. And uh, uh, I think that more than anything else, then plus uh, what Art was saying, the uh, the flag mean meant a little bit more, uh, being a patriot mean a little bit more. And Pat Murphy on the phone with us, of course, you continued on in a career that you started in the <coughs> Army so it, um, uh, as a journalist, so it affected you certainly in that way, but how would you say uh, your service affected you? Well, I think uh, I'll agree with the gentleman there that we grew up very, very fast uh, serving in Korea. We, we arrived as boys and left as men. Um, I also developed a real appreciation for uh, the broader world. Uh, I never really thought too much about Asia, quite frankly, but that experience over there uh, showed that we have had a have a critical role in that part of the world, and uh, and as a consequence, uh, I read about it constantly now. Very interesting. I I want to thank all of you for appearing on both the program and the dialogue web extra to talk about your experiences in Korea. Very important that people hear from you and know about your service. So thank you for your service and thanks for uh, appearing on Dialogue. I appreciate it. You've been listening to a Dialogue Web Extra on the 60th anniversary of the Korean War. We've been talking to several Korean War veterans from Idaho. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'm Marcia Franklin.